Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be doing Portuguese. No. Today we're going to be doing So You Want to Play Portuguese. That makes more sense. And if you guys aren't familiar with the series of So You Want to Play, we choose one civilization, in this case Portuguese, and we're going to do an in-depth dive of how to play the Civ, both in theory by taking a look at the technology tree and the bonuses and seeing what the Civ has to offer. And then I'm going to go ahead and play a ranked game against the top level opponent and seeing how the Civ, or see rather, how the Civ plays out in practice so we can get a good idea of how it's played in theory and how it's played in practice. Combine that two to get us the most amount of knowledge for the civilization in case you guys want to pick it up as one of your main go-to civilizations. So without further ado, let's just hop into this one and we have Portuguese. Let's go for it. I already played the game, I'm going to be casting it as a recorded game and going through my thought process during it, and it's a very good one, so stay tuned and we'll both enjoy that one, or all enjoy that one. It's not just one person talking to you, hopefully talking to more than just one person. That's the idea of a content creator, right? Alright, so we got Portuguese here, they're described as a naval and gunpowder civilization, we'll be playing them on Arabia though. All units cost minus 20% gold. Now that right off the bat seems like a very good bonus. Gold is a very good resource in a late game. So this is bonus is more of like a mid to late game kind of bonus, but it could help a lot in feudal age if you're massing archers as well. Next up, they got the technologies being researched 30% faster. That's one of their new bonuses, and I think it's a very good one as well. It's not an amazing bonus that's gonna really like, you know, just turbo your development faster than your opponent, like, and, and, and make you get like certain crazy advantages. It more or less just lets you hit better timings with your attacks. Like, for example, if you go crossbow, bodkin arrow, and castle age, it comes in like 10 seconds early or something like that. You know, I don't get the exact numbers. And then you can just pick up a, you know, a nice tech transition in the mid game uh, slightly faster than your opponent can. So it's not bad, but it's not an amazing bonus. Uh, definitely worth mentioning though. And then obviously ships plus 10% HP, not gonna be relevant here. And then you can build Saturia and Imperial Age. I hate this building, but it's pretty good, especially on island type maps. Next up, we got the unique unit, which is the organ gun, and they also have a caravel, which is a warship. And the organ gun is pretty interesting. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, then their unique tax. Oh, sorry about that. Um, they've got Karak, which is the castage one, giving the ships plus one plus one armor. We don't care about that for this video, but as you can see, in Portuguese, are a very strong naval civilization. So if you want to play them on water, definitely feel free to do so with the Civ. And then after that, you've got Arquebus, which is gunpowder units are more accurate. Uh, this actually means, I don't like this description, what this actually means is that gunpowder units have ballistics. Literally, whatever ballistics does for an archer, this tech gives it for gunpowder units, which is bombard cannon, um, bombard tower benefits from ballistics, so it doesn't count on it as it, but gunpowder units like hand cannon, organ gun, which is a unique unit, and bombard cannon are benefited from this, okay? And then they have the team bonus, which is the line of sight is shared with the team starting in the Dark Age. Normally with other civilizations, you need a market and feudal age to be able to get that bonus. So it just gives it to you a little bit earlier without the need of a market. Relevant for 1v1, of course. All right, for the technology tree, right off the bat, we see their archer range is actually quite stacked. So the only thing they're really missing is the cav archer. Uh, and the reason I say stacked is that they got arbalest, skirm, and hand cannon, but they also get cheaper arbalest and hand cannon. So it's actually a very good archer range and probably one of their best tools in most of their games. You could go cav archers in castle age, but I highly recommend staying away from them because they don't really scale well into late game, missing two very key upgrades, heavy sea and parth and tactics. Moving along for the barracks, and once again, a very, very stacked barracks. In fact, they have a fully upgraded barracks, except missing squires. Missing squires is a little bit awkward. It makes like long swordsmen against eagles pretty awkward. It makes halberdier pretty awkward against cav. So I will say use the barracks sparingly, but it's still, you know, it's still useful if you need infantry just to go ahead and pick up halberdier or champion, no problem. Uh, their champs, especially in late game, costing 10% less gold is actually quite decent for their late game. So definitely feel free to go for the champions if you need them. And then their stable looks pretty empty here, missing uh, Hussar, Paladin, not getting any special regional units. But you actually get Knights and Cavalier and Light Calf fully upgraded from the Blacksmith and 20% off gold for Cavaliers. So their Knight line is actually pretty dangerous as well and is worth going in to Knights instead of Light Calf and Castle Age because of that gold discount, if, in, you know, in my opinion, in some cases. Uh, for the Siege now, it's actually looking pretty mediocre. However, you got to remember that Bomber Cannons can benefit from Archibus. So in late game, it's pretty much your go-to unit. Uh, so definitely like the Bomber Cannon there. Uh, and you also get benefit from the gold discount, I believe. And don't quote me on that because I'm not sure if it benefits Siege, but I think it does. It should. It's, it says all units. So I think it's Siege, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but if you do, that's obviously a very good bonus. Blacksmith, full upgrades, like I said, very nice. 
Probably should have done my research about that siege thing. Their dock is also very good, missing shipwright and fast fire ship, but everything else is very good. And their caravel acts as kind of like a scorpion on the water, so it's very good against massed galleons or massed longboats, but not very good against fast fire, fire ships, for example. Uh, the university is quite good. You have bomber tower, architecture, and siege engineers, which is the main three to look for, really. Fortified wall is there. All right, so the organ gun. Organ gun is quite expensive at 80 wood and 70 gold, but it basically sp fires a spread of bullets, basically, that do splash damage when they hit. Think of it kind of like, uh, kind of like a mini mangonel, uh, I would say. It, it's kind of what the organ gun is. So it does, you know, a decent amount of damage. It also gets good spread. So against mass crossbows, for example, if you get a nice shot in, you can kill multiple of them at once. And against groups of like infantry, you can also get good splash damage on there. And they have just high damage in general that work against cavalry as well so they're kind of like a really strong unit and they count as a siege unit so you don't upgrade them into blacksmith you upgrade them through siege engineers and through chemistry i believe that helps them i'm not 100 sure though uh, but siege engineer definitely gives them extra range and you can also repair them with a villager as opposed to healing them with a monk so that's the only thing you need to really know about them there and yeah that's pretty much it um next up we've got the no hoardings, as Mendoza will mention it. Uh, monastery. Monastery is very good for Portuguese. Sanctity, block printing, and redemption. And you also save 20% gold on every monk. So monk costs 80 gold instead of 100. That's a pretty good discount there. So feel free to use the monks whenever you can. Uh, then moving along, their eco is pretty standard. You also get the Fitoria as well. Uh, so no problem there. And yeah, can't really complain about this. Very, very strong tech tree. All right. So that's pretty much how... Portuguese are looking like as a civilization. I will say though, like on first glance, they seem like kind of an archer sieve and you are blessed to get the cheaper uh, gold units. So that's benefits archers, good monks as well. So I'm you know, thinking like, you know, monk, uh, monk are blessed help seems pretty reasonable as a composition. And I will agree with you. That's a really good composition. They also have gunpowder. I will say don't sleep on Portuguese cap. Portuguese cavalry, knights, minus 20% gold is actually very good. So I would say, that with Portuguese, they're pretty well-rounded these days. They can do a lot of things. And don't be afraid to tech switch because your technology is research 30% faster. So if you're playing with archers, feel free to tech into light cab or knights. And if you start with knights, feel free to go skirmishers, then switch into like knights, uh, sorry, switch into crossbows, whatever it is that you need uh, to go into Imperial Age, for example, because they're pretty flexible. They can play Cav and Imp, they can play Arbus and Imp, no problem. And you can also play some sort of gunpowder. Your main siege unit should probably be the Bombard Cannon, but anything is fair game in Castle Age with their siege shop as well. All right, so that's pretty much how I feel about Portuguese. Let's go ahead and take a look at the game. I'm scratching my leg a lot, guys. I have a really itchy leg for no reason at all. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the load game file here. I'm going to go to replays. And I did play it on my Smurf. It is against MBL. He's playing as the Tatars. Um, yeah, sorry about this. I'm kind of just trying to get comfortable here. He's playing as the Tatars. I'm playing as the Portuguese. Okay, this pillow has to go. <laughs> okay. He's playing as the Tatars. And I'm playing as the Portuguese here. And let's take a look and see how this game develops here. Uh, sorry about the delays. All right. So, uh, we win those is obviously me. And let's hop into it. So, you have to play some chess. And that is actually, I want to do live commentary. Funny story, I went through a live commentary and MBL was playing chess. So like I was sitting there for like two minutes waiting. I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm not gonna start the video by waiting two minutes and nothing happening. So I scrapped that and now I'm doing a recorded game commentary, but this is maybe even a better quality for you guys to enjoy. So Portuguese versus Tataris. Real quick, I'm gonna show both maps. So I'm looking like I've got three wood lines here. Gold is a bit, you know, maybe forward gold. Uh, one at the back though, two stones and berries to the back with deer to the back. So looking okay on my side. And MBL, which I don't know yet. He's got pretty good forest as well. Side gold is, isn't bad as well. And well, the front of his map is quite open. So he's got maybe slightly worse map there than I do. But I'm sure he'll make it work, especially with the Tars. And now I'm going to go back and watch it from my Fog of Wars just to really guide you through my decision making. And obviously I didn't know how his map looked like at this point. So bear that in mind when I, uh, you know, when you see the moves that I go for. So the first thing with every Age of Empires 2 game, and I mentioned this in pretty much all of my So You Want to Play videos, and I'm making a lot of So You Want to Play videos for the subathon that was going on on Twitch right now. Uh, hopefully it's still going on. This is, I think, the fourth or something video in the queue that you guys can enjoy and watch. And if you're watching this on YouTube later, check if we're still live on Twitch. We're doing a pretty big subathon, so definitely stop by and give us a follow and see what's up. Uh, but nonetheless here, we've got Portuguese versus Tatars. The most important thing about every Age of Empires 2 game is to think about the Sid matchup in the Dark Age. 
I'm doing nothing here. I'm learning deer. I'm going to the to wood. You know, this could be difficult for some players, so don't load deer if it's too difficult. No problem if you're newer to the game, absolutely. But Dark Age is by far the easiest point of the game. There's not as much going on as what happens later. So in this moment, really think about the Civ matchup. And so I thought about it, and I opened with three on wood, and I want to go scouts. Mm -hmm. But then I thought of it more, and I said, no, I need to go four on wood. And the reason is, I'm scared of playing against the Tar Crossbows in early Castle Age. I can't really match them because they get free thumb rings. So I don't want to just go scouts into skirmishers, which would normally be the counter to Drush FC from him, or just like archers from him. Because then I'm not using the gold bonus of Portuguese. If I go scouts into skirms, then it's like I spend like 20 minutes of the game and I don't use any bonus. Uh, any gold unit for the bonus. So I decided instead that I have to go Drush FC because if I go Drush FC, I can match his crossbows. And you know, if he's going Drush FC as well, I can just play defensively and use my gold bonus to outmass him, for example. So that was kind of my thought process. Drush FC was my go-to strategy in this matchup. And judging from my map, I felt like it was reasonably you know, doable. I had pretty good wood lines and you know, I felt like I can, I can pull it off. So that's my strategy right off the bat. And I did give the matchup some deep thought as well. I expected him to go either, you know, scouts, archer opening, men at arms. He can do whatever he wants with the tar. I also considered Drush FC, and I felt like for Portuguese, Drush FC is the best response to all of those uh, openings, pretty much. So here I am, just going about my uh, regular, my regular movements. Uh, there's a little bit of banter here, actually. <laughs> he said, um, he said, uh, you know, are you not streaming? I said, no. He said, wow. I said, I'm taking a break with some World of Warcraft because that is exactly what MBL was doing recently. So. Uh, good to see MBL back, and good to see my second board coming in safely as well. So now I'm going to be going about the build pretty standard. I'm just going to go with a standard Drush FC, and now I'm going to go scout my opponent's base. And I'm going to put a house down and then a barracks. I actually should have quick walled that villager in as soon as I saw the scouts, but for some reason I kind of froze and I was too busy thinking of trying to hide the fact that I'm making a barracks. That's my idea with building a house first that I completely forgot that he can just kill my villager and MBL is going to go ahead and pick that one off. Fair play from him. That villager should not have been out there so far without being quick walled in. Well played to him. He gets a quick villager for his troubles. And that's quite bad for me, but it's, you know, it's still early in the game to really be too, you know, too decisive. I still want to commit to my Dresh FC because my assessment of earlier is still correct. You know, despite losing one villager, it's still best strategy to go Dresh FC with Portuguese. That doesn't change. All right, fantastic. So now the barracks is going to go down. I lost the position I wanted. I wanted to wall with it. Now I'm forced to do it a bit further back. So it's not looking that good for me so far. Losing that villager delayed the drush, but I'm still going to commit to it you know, for the reasons I mentioned earlier. I'm now scouting my opponent. And the one thing I want to mention is look at my scouting at home, guys. I watched a lot of games in various levels, especially with the guest, the ELO series that we're doing. And I noticed that a lot of people scout the opponent before they have such good exploration. Look at this. I know where all three of my golds are. I know where both my stones are. And I know how to wall my map. That's three criteria that you need to have before going to scout your opponent in most cases. So make sure to remember that one. And that goes beyond just finding your boars and sheep. That's mandatory at the start of every game. All right. Speaking of guess the ELO, this guy here in the blue can't be higher than 1500 idols near the TC. Luckily for me, though, I didn't lose the scouts. For some reason, MBL was not garrisoned everything, or he had very little villagers there. Maybe he thought I'd move, I don't know. Or maybe he garrisoned everything, I don't know. But I survived with 9 HP, and I'm, I'm pretty bummed at this point, to be honest. I was like, I was like, wow, this is going terribly, isn't it? Because I have three militia and the Drush Slates. I lost the villa and my scout's hurting. So, yeah, it's not looking that good. Actually, one thing I thought of right now is, since my Drush is so late, I thought maybe MBL thinks it's Man at Arms. That's what I wanted to try on Bates. Like, I want to try to make him think that it's Men at Arms. And the reason I wanted him to think that is because if he thinks this is Men at Arms, he won't counterattack with like a tower or something, or, you know, go heavy and feudal to try and punish me. He'd probably just play more or less standard. So I tried to make it seem like this timing was Men at Arms, because it is very close to Men at Arms timing. Uh, but at this point, that whole bluff is pretty much failed. So he probably assumes that it's just the Drush at this point and a late Drush at that. But by that point, I'm already fully walled. So he pretty much lost his window of opportunity to counterattack and punish my Drush FC. All right, so now I've got my Drush causing corruption in the land, pretty much just trying to cause as much mayhem as possible. Forcing some idle time from the villagers, but MBL smartly just pulls them back, snipes the scout that was already weak, and uses two spearmen and a couple scouts to really just clean up these, uh, these hooligans, these militia. 
And you know what? I, I wish I got more damage with the Drush. Everyone does. But in this case, because it came in so late, because of all the things that went wrong, I'm pretty much just happy to buy as much time as possible. So you'll see me trading as the scout HP. Buy as much time. At this point, MBL, he obviously knows I'm doing Drush FC. That's not a secret. Um, but I feel like that's okay. I feel like I'm okay with going Drush FC versus Tatars. And one thing you'll notice is very interesting is... Since I'm doing Drush FC, it doesn't give him a chance to play Thumb Ring, Crossbows, and Castle Agent. That's the one thing, as Portuguese, that scares me from Tatars, is them going Crossbows in the early Castle Age and just having Thumb Ring advantage over me and snowballing, and snowballing that advantage. That was the one thing I'm scared of from this game, but now we're not really going to have to worry about that. And the reason is because he's pretty much forced to react to my Crossbows now. With Josh FC, I'll have more of a crossbow mass than he will ever be able to have with Scout's opening. Sorry, I need I need that pillow. The one I threw up, my back is hurting. I need I need the pillow. It's a freaking like booster pillow. Alright, sorry about that. Alright. I hate back pain, but I'm gonna be patient through it. And hopefully you guys can bear with me here as well. Alright, fantastic. Look at me all back pain free now with the pillow. Alright, pe uh not Pello. Archer range coming up here, and let me just make sure everything's good on OBS. Fantastic, because it better be, or else this is going to be useless. Archer range is coming up, and that's going to be good for some uh, archer production now as well. And one thing you notice with my build loader now, I'm playing as the Portuguese. I get cheaper archer range units. I am going to go 7 on gold instead of 8 for the Dresh FC build loader. And that's going to be very good with Portuguese. Gets one village elsewhere, and that's how to use... An eco bonus. If you blindly follow a builder and you go eight on gold, like it's suggested, or nine, or whatever it is the case, you're gonna float gold. And so your eco bonus goes from, or your discount goes from something that can save you economy to just floating resources for no reason. And it's not as efficient as you can get it. Something to consider for sure when dealing with early game builders. All right, so Blacksmith's coming down, and it's not going to be the cleanest Drush of Sea build you've ever seen. Portuguese don't get the best economy bonus in the Dark Age and Feudal Age, and I also lost the Villager. So I'm looking like a 1730 Andy for the for the Castage time. It's not like a 1650 kind of kind of dank build over there, some smooth, fast attack kind of style. It's going to be a bit later, but nonetheless, I'm going to go two ranges, commit heavily to crossbows, put pressure on my opponent, and pretty much prevent him from playing crossbows, which is once again the thing I'm scared of from Tatars. If they go crossbow to Cowboys and get a smooth little gameplay uh, from there. Alright, so just gonna go ahead and fast forward because not much is really happening here. I'm just gonna go over the fast castle, clearing some units he had near me. MBL's not too bothered losing the Spearman. If anything, now he just knows that I'm doing crossbow and he's not like guessing if I'm doing knights or something you know, crazy like that. Um, so yeah, indeed it's gonna be Drush FC crossbow. And I'm going to go out with 8 or so uh, archers there. I take a small pause. I'm not sure what that was for. But yeah, pause or pause is done. And archers are moving across the map now. And 8 archers is very good because once they become crossbow, that's actually the perfect number to one-shot villagers. Uh, so I'm going to be going across the map here, massing at home to defend myself in case he attacks me through the wall I broke. And I'm going to be looking for some damage right off the bat. I assume I'm going to be fully walled. That's the main assumption. But even if your fear opponent is fully walled, there's a few things you can do with your crossbows. Look for wood lines to hit behind the wood line, for example. Look if there's any exposed villagers on farms or anything like gold exposed that you can hit. And if you can't find that, just pressure a wall and try to break in. You never know what, what will happen. In the meantime, I'm also going to be killing his scouts here, which doesn't really matter, but I did kill it. So I'm going to hit casters now. And okay, this is a turning point of the game. So keep your eyes open. He ejects his skirmishers. I don't know where he took them, actually, but he ejects his skirmishers. I have to make a choice. Do I run inside to attack the, to attack a pretty much a prepared MBL, or do I run away and conserve those crossbows? Now I decide to go inside. The reason I made this choice is because I felt like I have to do damage, and I actually pick up a villager right off the bat. I feel like I have to do damage, and I wouldn't mind sacrificing these eight crossbow to cause mayhem. And I actually get quite lucky as MBL quick balls here. I'm landing. Two villagers, there's three villagers already down, four villagers, and I managed to sneak in through his base before he actually gets the defense down. And that's going to be another vill. Meanwhile, his skirms went up to the front, so I have to run back with these crossbows. He went for the counterattack immediately. He's down like six, maybe seven villagers now, and he's losing a lot. Seven villas down for him, and I still got four crossbows in his base. I notice he's got a seed chop, and I notice he sent the skirms forward. So as I'm killing villagers, I'm also rushing down a seed chop at home for myself. 
And obviously it's not perfect. He's losing a lot of those at home, but he's gonna get some retaliation damage. As you can see here with the skirmishers, I missed my quick wall, I lose a villager here. I don't make a scorpion for whatever reason. I thought I clicked it. So I got no scorpion coming out, even though I desperately need one. And these guys pick one more bill. Look at that, fantastic. He's at 26 bills and I'm at 38. And right there, that's a game winning move for me, as long as I don't take enough or too much damage from the skirmishers. However, I take too much damage from the skirmishers. <laughs> like way more damage than I needed. Look at that good micro from MBL there, moving side to side here. He, MBL is one with the skirmisher, you know what I mean? They might as well have MBL face on them at this point. Nonetheless, I'm trying some fancy micro. I'm, at this point, I'm wondering where the scorpion is finally comes out. And he got some pretty good trades. He's idling villagers. He's even killed a couple so far. And he's going to get another one on the farm here as it's quite low. Boom. Snipe it. One more. There it is. It goes down. And now I'm going to chase him away with the scorpion. He finds another villager there. So Emil has actually got some pretty good counter attack here with the few skirmishers. And he still has the counter unit to my crossbow. So his score is higher. Probably needs exploration. Probably killed more. Yeah, KD is in his favor. Uh, but I'd say I'm pretty ahead in this game. I've got a 10 village lead, which is pretty massive. And the only way MBL can recover from that is either by going for an all-in push and killing me uh, and snowballing that push with like mangonels and skirmishers, or just try to boom back in the game and you know add TCs to lower the vill count uh, or fill the vill deficiency. Because honestly, his skirmishers messed me up a lot. It killed a few villagers and it messed me up a lot. We're going to enter into another engagement here, and it's going to be a pretty wacky one here. He's going to out micro the skirmishers, move them side to side. I'm trying to go for the scorpion, but he's moving side to side as well, getting some shots where he can. I get the scorpion and run away with only a couple casualties there on my end. So I'd say it's a pretty even trade, and I'm going to get a monastery to heal up my units. I love doing monastery to heal up units more and more these days, just because I feel like it's such a good building to have to pick up relics, Heal my units and convert enemy units with a few monks. Like, that's so much value that you get. And it's a building that you need for Imperial Age. So, I, 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 I'm a huge fan of the early monastery. Especially in cases where you have a lot of hurt units. More so with knights, but also pretty good with expos that took a lot of damage from siege. Alright. Skirmishers are harassing my woodland and as you can see, I'm not sure if MBL, let's take a look. Yeah, look, he's added a second TC faster than me and he's adding a third one now. So although he was pretty far behind, since my eco was pretty messed up after his raid and since I had a fragile eco because I was trash of C, he's able to add some TCs down, get the TCs down and actually catch up in vill count. So it's crazy how me killing 10 villagers because he disrupted my perfect economy and my fragile economy with skirmishers, he's actually able to close the gap here and get a pretty even game out of a game that should probably be just be over because of my early game raid. So I like that MBL is really trying to make a game out of this instead of just calling it early because he lost a few bills. His scrims are gonna cause me another bunch of problems. Second scrim is gonna come out and make things a lot easier for me, but he's gonna get some decent value there, picking up a couple crossbows. And at this point, I've had enough. I want to be the guy pushing now because I'm clearing up his skirmishers. I've got good, good, good army composition here, crossbows and siege. And I want to just start working on his buildings. The reason why I can't go too far forward is because he's got a siege shop and I'm scared of his mangonels just popping out and doing a lot of damage to me or getting good trades on my mangonels. So that's pretty much the thing I'm worried about the most. And as far as my eco at home, I got two TC set up, no problem. And third one's coming out so Vildeed he's actually gonna start taking the lead there look at that even Vildeed he's maybe even taking the lead soon and I only now have my third TC so it's back to being a perfectly even game and that's kind of the problem with the Drush FC the Fragile Eco if it gets harassed can be pretty problematic for you and obviously the, the Tatar Eco is really good uh, even if it loses a few uh, villagers because you get the extra sheep on your TC so it's very easy to add TCs and sustain build production. All right, good play from him to get in the middle of my army. So both my forward army and my reinforcing army. With a few skirmishers, he's just going to cause a little bit of mayhem here. I get a good conversion though with the monk. And I get a good trade with the mangonel at the front. So I go one for zero, kill a mangonel for free, convert the skirmisher, and really just trying to put some pressure now while booming at home. Um, and you can see that as my macro gets a little bit poor in a second. And I'm now losing a mangonel. He gets a good trade back. And I really want to get that Mangonel because 
because I'm I'm competitive like that. I'm not I'm not happy with him getting a free Maganel, so I'm gonna waste my entire army basically just to make sure I get that Maganel down. Glad I can be so stubborn sometimes. Um, but nonetheless, I'm using this time as well to pick up some relics. So even if he's gonna have, you know, he doesn't have more bills, but even if he caught up in bills, I'll take more relics. I'll start looking for the next advantage, the next advantage. It's all about, you know, going for the next thing in line. Uh, always staying one step ahead of the game. He gets another good trade with the Manganels. So I'm is doing pretty much the best thing he can to get back in the game, taking good trades and booming pretty much. Nice try with the attack round there, but I think that's gonna cost him that Mangano. Uh, takes a pretty decent hit there, but he still has good HP because of the repairs. V woman behind as well. Good split from me. Epic casting here. Look at that. Mangano shots left and right. Another Mangano coming in. Attack round. I just dodge easy out of the way. Scorpion feels like the one kind of odd man out of this whole party. Dies and yeah, that's pretty rough for that Scorpion. But I get a nice trade on the hill here. If he's the leader, he would have killed my Mangano. And before someone in the chat asks why delete, someone please in the chat explain what the delete trick does as I go ahead and use that. Even if I'm on the high ground, deleting is just so OP. And now I'm bringing in two more mangonels, and I've pretty much won the trade at the front. But the beautiful thing that I've that I've got for myself right now is not the trades. It's the full map control that I have to pick up relics, to boom freely. That's the benefit of attacking in my opinion. I lock down a position and I boom behind it, pick relics, and just have a smooth game. And now, he doesn't know what I'm doing behind this. I can do a forward castle if I had the stone. He doesn't know if I'm mining or not. I can be doing a night transition, which is actually what I'm doing, making use of the Portuguese tech transitions, uh, or faster tech transition, and the gold discount to go with double gold unit composition. I can also be going for fast and arbalest. I can be doing so many different things behind this that MBL is pretty much just left guessing as well. That Magna shot helps the guessing game a lot. So good shot there for him. But uh, yeah, he's, he's stuck guessing and I'm just gonna be going for the next step all the time. And we don't know what MBL is doing here. I have no idea. I don't even know the bill counts, but I, I imagine it's quite close. But I like my position, especially, uh, especially because, you know, the fact that I'm the aggressor. It's just so easy to be the aggressor in comparison to the to the defender uh, in this game. All right, another good Magano trade for me, and he was probably looking elsewhere there. And now, really, the game-winning move for me, in my opinion, or you know, even if it, you'd say I'm winning already at this point, this is kind of like the game-ending move, the stamp on the envelope. Knight's coming out plus two, and I'm gonna hide them till I have a good reason to show them. And he's probably going to still be massing skirmishers. There you go. We saw them. And siege, because why would he transition? That's literally the perfect composition to fight what I have, except when I mix in knights. And I saw those skirmishers, so I'm going to just go ahead and pick up those skirms using my four knights, clear them up real quick. And at this point, he's pretty much dead because he's losing too many units here. His buildings are going down on the front. Bill count isn't looking too hot for him. It's about even. And I've got all the momentum in the world with a double gold unit composition, which is so hard to stop. And this is the power of Portuguese. That mid-game spike where you can go double gold unit. I got knights under his TC. I got knights on the side. I got crossbow manual from the front. Just looking so clean for me. And uh, it, it couldn't have been a better knight transition here. Sniping siege and sniping skirmishers. And well, he's probably going to just try and play on for a little bit after this. But as you can see, after a few knights, after he saw the transition... I'm just gonna go up to Imp now. So it delayed me and it, oh, that's a nice shot. I remember that actually. <laughs> that's a nice shot, I wasn't looking. I looked back and I had one crossbow. I was like, what happened? Well played there, MB. But uh, yeah, now I'm gonna go up to Imp. So like, just that small knight transition, getting me the map control, or keeping me the map control, delaying my opponent, and now I'm just gonna be able to go up to Imp. And just gonna give you guys a, a quick snippet of MBL's economy right now. It's pretty in shambles. He has a lot of bills, but it's pretty messy. And so now he's stuck in the castle age. He's stuck, like, you know, reacting in castle age. He's gonna go camels, drop a bunch of stables. He lost the blacksmiths. He has to remake it, and it's just so messy from his position. And while he's remassing or massing camels to adapt to my knights, meanwhile at home, because I'm double gold in a composition, I'm just gonna be massing crossbows to be able to counter those camels anyways and prepare for our blessed imperial age. So it just—it's honestly just such a good, such a good trick with the civilization to play double gold in castle age at some point. Uh, instead of going light cab, which is what normal sips can do, because normal sips really have trouble affording, you know, both knights and crossbows in castle. You could do it, but it's very hard with other sips. Portuguese have a much easier time doing it. 
and knights are just so much stronger than light cap in a lot of cases and especially in this case where you know a few knights can actually just snipe a, few, a bit of siege and some skirmishers and force a bunch of camels it's much better than having to tech light cap and spending a bunch of food on units that probably just die to tc fire anyway half the time as well because they're lacking 40 hp compared to the knight all right, so they're just taking some pretty good fights. Again, the camels aren't sufficient here because they've got the crosses behind. He's also lacking some upgrades because I killed his blacksmith. You guys see how it's all adding up here and it's gonna all come down to just me getting imp and him just being nowhere near imp. As you can see, he's still heavy committing in castleage. And even if I wasn't up to imp, I'd probably still be able to close this out in castleage because his economy is so disturbed because I've been able to attack one skirmisher causing a lot of corruption here as well. And he's just gonna call it as I reach imperial age because quite frankly, there's nothing he can do. I'm full boom at home. Um, I got the Portuguese power spike and castlage with the double gold unit composition to secure the, to secure the map. Um, I killed those early vills, so I did have an early game lead, and then I'm simply snowballing it now. My composition is probably gonna be like Cavalier Arbalest for a while, and I'm just taking the gold on the map and getting castles, so. With four relics in Portuguese, man, don't be afraid to play double gold unit composition. I think that's like the biggest takeaway with the civilization is don't be afraid to play double gold unit composition. And it's something we didn't really consider too heavily from the theory perspective. Even though we thought that it would be good in theory, we didn't see it have that play out in practice and, and why it's so powerful. But now that we've seen a game, we can actually understand why it's so powerful to do double gold unit composition and not be stuck playing light cab instead of knights, which is a good option, don't get me wrong. Light cab and late castle is a good option, but it's a lot more intense on your food and food is probably the resource you're gonna need for Imperial Age as well. A thousand food is pretty hefty cost, and it's just nowhere near as powerful as the Knights compared to, you know, obviously Knights versus Light Cap. So while Light Cap crossbows are a good mix for other civs with Portuguese going Knights and crossbows, just gives you that extra little bit of power and good savings there to be able to let you transition to Imperial Age after and not burn all your food and getting a good discount on the gold as well. Take a look at the KD there, pretty even. The stats here real quick, and of course the timeline which doesn't tell the whole story. I had a population lead, I also had the map control lead, and I also had the relic lead. So this is a pretty smooth game for me near the end. And yeah, that's gonna be pretty much it. Thanks all for watching. Um, these So You Wanna Play videos will be coming out pretty much um, on YouTube once every few days. I'm gonna be really getting more of these and trying to finish the series. And if you guys are watching on Twitch for the subathon, first of all, sub it up and keep the stream going. And second of all, while I'm sleeping here, second of all, I uh, hope you guys are enjoying the So You Want to Play content and I'm going to be having more of these coming your way and I'll be mixing in, you know, one video that's going to be so gameplay, like a So You Want to Play video and one video that's going to be like kind of a tier list or a talking video just to keep a little bit of, uh, a little bit of content for everyone uh, on the stream. So thanks for watching. Take care, those on YouTube and on Twitch and I'll catch you guys next time. Peace.